Um, and we promise to keep this a bit more conversational. Um, I don't mean to kick this off, but I think I, someone has to. Um, I, th I know, Laria, you have a question. Do you want to kick the conversation off and get us going? And then we'll take it from there. We have extra mics. Uh, Christina and I will be um, walking around with them. So if you have a comment, a question, anything, just a quick signal of hands and we'll um, join you with a mic as quickly as we can. Um, please be reminded that your voice will be recorded and put online, but I think you kind of got that idea by now. So, Laura, you already have a mic. I seem to have a mic, yes. So, my question, and it's a question for all of us. I mean, Martin talks about surveillance and Audrey talks about the kinds of challenges we're facing, but here we are. We're in this system. We're not outside of it. How do we behave ethically? That's an easy one. That's an easy one, right. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think that it is incredibly challenging to behave ethically. I mean, I think about this all the time with just with my, the, the technologies that I use, sort of making that sort of um, devil's pact. It's like, well, I should quit Facebook, but I'm a freelance writer and I need to promote my work. Um, so I'll say on Facebook, um, I should quit Twitter, um, but that's how I stay in contact with everyone. Um, I think that, I mean, a couple of things. One is, um, I think, making these decisions for myself is one thing. If you're in a p position where you are compelling people to use tools, that's something else that's a little bit different. Um, for educators, for example, compelling their students to use tools. Um, places in which you're forced to use a tool is a, is a, is a different kind of, uh, is a different conversation. Um, yeah, there is no there is no outside of capitalism. I think we just still need to be to be incredibly mindful, and I think that there are ways in which we can push back. Um, there was a for a while. I think Mozilla um, and the EFF had a had a browser uh, add-on called Privacy Badger that would block your data. But I saw one um, recently that was. Oh, now I can't remember what animal it was. But it was pro privacy possum, perhaps, <laughs> in which it just invented a bunch of fake shit. So, so instead of stopping websites from taking your data, you just gave them a bunch of bad data, which I love, um, I love as much. And so I think that there, we have to be, I think we can make personal decisions and be as ethical as possible. But I think that we can also just work really hard to make it as difficult for these technologies to profit off our data as we can. Yeah, I think it's um, it's something that we've got to make our own personal decision on, and, and that is that uh, takes continual renegotiation and continual thought as to where we draw these lines. And it, it's like we've been discussing that you know we're in the middle of strikes in higher education at the moment in the UK. I'm a union member, I'm breaking strike by being here. I was on strike on Monday, I will be going back on strike next week. And um, yeah, strike breaking is something that you don't just do without a lot of thought. And the reason that I'm here today is I think that the conversations that we're having here today are extremely relevant to why we're striking in the UK. Um, which is we're striking about the rights to our pensions, but also working conditions and precarity and all the words that were on that slide up there that are going to be explored at the OER20 conference about exploitation, about precarity, about how we negotiate and fit in that system. And I think that we have to, we have to make these decisions on a personal level, but I think we also have to be cognizant of the other people that our decisions affect. Um, and we have to make our judgments and our decisions in the face of that. And I think that does take continual renegotiation and it's not always easy. Um, but so, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly my personal perspective on it. And it is something that is kind of very much at the forefront of my mind at the moment because of the strikes. To pick up on one of the things that Audrey mentioned there about uh, the other ways to subvert 
um, the, the, the commodification of our data. There was quite an interesting um, occurrence just in the UK this week of one of the institutions. So, so when you go on strike in the UK, you're not legally beholden to tell your employer that you are going to go on strike before you actually do it. After the strike, you have to, because obviously you get your wages docked. But you don't have to tell your employer beforehand. And obviously, if you don't tell your employer, it will have a bigger impact. The strike will have a bigger impact because they don't know to cash until lectures in advance, etc., etc. So one institution in the UK put up a form and asked students to fill in the form to say which of their lecturers were not on campus. Um, however, they didn't lock the form down. And of course, people saw it immediately and sent it all over Twitter. The, oh, look, such and such university has put up a grass on your lecturer form. And of course, everyone has been filling it <coughs> with fake data, and that's just going to become meaningless. So there are, always, there are these little acts of subversion, um, which may seem quite small, but send quite powerful messages, I think, to the powers that be sometimes. It's, it's nice, actually, to be on a panel where you get asked if you want to say something, rather than just uh, people going on and on and on. It's a nice yeah, change of pace. I'm enjoying this. Um, but I just wanted to say, I think they are open initiatives when we think more about in how institutions can be ethically um, making ethical choices and I think it is about knowledge sharing and particularly about technology and tools. Um, I meet so many institutions who are really hoodwinked when they purchase technology. They have no real understanding of how it works. They don't know what questions to ask. They're kind of seeing dashboards and the words effective and you know budgets are going to be bigger you don't need as many people and they just like go for it um, and they are um, I think Christian I mentioned this earlier when we we're talking about a European project called the lace project um, which has made a checklist where you can you know at least as a starting point have some sort of agenda of questions you can ask like what data do you collect and how is it stored and how is it used and you know um, what is your business model five years down the line are you going to sell it all um, and I think there are Definitely, we know enough about technology as a community to ask better questions. So I think while you know, there is no easy way to make these choices, there are certainly tools that you can use to help you. Um, so that would be my recommendation in, in terms of trying to be more ethical in the usage. Uh, I think uh, um, I also think to bring it back to something that Martin said, as much as we can act as consumers, I do think we have to act as citizens as well, and we have to demand le legislative legislative change. In fact, I was um, on a walk with my husband uh, the other day, and I said, you know, being an American, I said, what, what wasn't there like a DDPR thing? Like, what happened? And he was like, oh, you know, Europe's gone. Like, no more innovation. They closed up shop. Everyone went away. All the tech businesses are gone. And so I think that the stories that, you know, the stories that we hear that somehow regulation is going to destroy these industries, I mean, on one hand, like good riddance. Um, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, I mean, I do think that taking, taking action as citizens is, is perhaps more powerful than taking actions merely as consumers. Martin has a question. Hold on. For making you walk over here, it's more uh, just a comment on that. In terms of legislation, I think it's often assumed that legislation will be put in place to protect us in individuals, and sometimes it might protect. Um, I've, I'm hesitant to say the majority. So, in particular, I'm thinking of broker bans. So, in Europe, I think there are about eight countries now where either the entire country or part of the country has some sort of ban against wearing burqas or um, uh, headscarves, but it actually extends um, to full face covering. So in France, for example, you know, if I went out in, with a, a hoodie on and a balaclava, I'm technically breaking French law. Um, and that legislation was you know, put in by a democratic country. Um, and the, the question I have is, who's that protecting? Um, because now face detection cameras, you know, from commercial companies, from 
police uh, can be surveilling uh, a lot easier than if I was had a, a face covering. So that's my reflection on that. One of the um, one of the things this reminded me of is is I saw someone blogging the other day about um, like they were an open practitioner and they're very engaged in their community neighborhood um, and they were talking about how they appreciate you know sharing looking after each other while they are away and contributing and then one person in their neighborhood got a video doorbell um, and then you know they were discussing this my neighbor now has a video doorbell my door is in shot you know. I didn't, like, how does that work? And um, and I think the more I learn about consumer, like smart consumer products in particular, the more I think the kind of, the work we're trying to do to think about these ethical implications or what kind of power and agency we have, the, the more I think it is about each other as well and the choices. And just disclaimer, I start ranting when we talk about video doorbells, so I'm not gonna go there, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, that's a very scary <laughs> thought. <laughs> and Amazon Ring, I think that's the, the you know, work in that area. But I think, I mean, what a lot of this comes down to, and again, it's it's the the question of where does openness in all this, I think, is fundamental. And if, and I think you're absolutely right. We're not asking the right questions of openness, and there we need to be a lot more critical about what we mean when we're talking about openness. And I certainly like the the perspective that. Um, uh, that Catherine Cronin often reminds us about how openness has got to be contextual and it's got to be a personal choice. And if it's not, then it's not really openness, it's something else altogether. And I think a lot of what we're seeing is not openness at all, it is something else altogether because our data is not being used with our by our choice and we, we don't have the, the ability to withhold it or withdraw it. And I, I think that's the really important thing is being able to ensure that we retain that idea of autonomy of choice within openness and that has to be there because if we lose that it's not openness it's something else altogether i think as i said earlier i mean i think we have let the word or i use we very very loosely here um not we the, the other we not the not the we in the room uh, we have we have let open do a lot of work for us without really examining the the politics of it. Um, I think that I think that I think a lot about and you know as I was thinking about preparing you know preparing some thoughts for tonight, I was thinking I don't know if I'm such a good um, voice to defend open these days. I feel quite um, frustrated by by and burned even by by a lot of the things that I would have five years definitely taken for granted. I don't openly license my work um, anymore. Um, I am happy to let you use my work, but you've got to talk to me. Um, I, I've stopped, I, I wanted to sort of push back on the idea of permissionless sharing. I wanted to talk more about consent. Um, and so I, I think a lot about these questions of, of the things that I thought I was, the things I thought I was doing with open that haven't, in, you know, as I've, sort of as I've continued to work um, in the field and be an online persona, um, what that looks like. And yeah, open, open, feels, um, open feels really troubling to me in, it, in, in ways that I've, I wouldn't have, I would definitely wouldn't have thought five years ago. I think my conclusion is that I think we just need to move on from the open question. So uh, one of the things I wanted to bring into this conversation was vulnerability. And um, it maybe comes back a little bit more to the personal dimension, but I think it has an institutional sense as well, because you are vulnerable uh, in your whichever context you work in. And one of the things, um, you know, you I think it echoes a lot with me is is kind of how my perception has changed of how safe it is to be open or how positive it has an impact. And in some ways, I feel there is you know great gains to be made, but there's also 
a lot of vulnerability in open and I think I, I see that all the time in, in big works like scaled up works like the work you know at Wikimedia um, or large open um, educational project and uh, there is a kind of um, a tipping point I think where where you become too vulnerable to be in the open and, and that permission that's um, you know whether it's sharing or whether it's kind of the perception that whatever you put out there is kind of anybody's to do with as they like, whether it's commercial or non-commercial or personal or non. Um, I think there is a real issue around that. And, and, and the political side of that, um, you know, Christian was saying to me earlier when I was um, talking about my experience of um, applying to become a citizen in, in Britain was, you know, the, the database my data is being held in, I, I find this is not satisfactory to me. And he was like, well, you know, he was joking and said, you know, but there's nothing to hide. And, and that mentality, you know, that y you kind of have to opt in because you have nothing to hide. I find that very troubling. And um, I think the vulnerability angle for me has become more pronounced. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. Um. Yeah, and I think, again, it does come back to this idea about choice. So, you know, we have to be able to have an, an, an consent. You know, we have to, if we're going to exist in the open, if we're going to be open practitioners in any way, we have to do that with our consent and we have to be aware of what we're consenting to. Um, one of the things I do in the, my job at the University of Edinburgh is um, I run workshops about academic blogging and um, we have a, a central, centrally supported WordPress server and I talk a lot about the benefits of blogging and the benefits of amplifying your blogs through social media. But I always make the point of saying that um, only do that if you feel comfortable. That this is not something that, I, that you know, your institution is telling you you must do. And you know, <coughs> your safety and your comfort online is paramount. It's more important than disseminating your research projects. So if you do not feel comfortable using social media professionally, don't do it. And there has to be that element of choice there, I think. I would, I would add that um, ideally that there's also an institutional or some sort of organizational, organizational understanding of what it looks like when a faculty member does get the ire of the internet trolls. Um, because I think that there are, you know, there are real consequences to, to, um, to being online that we can't just sort of blithely, uh, blithely, blithely ignore. And we, I think we have to be prepared. We have to know what to do when, open, when our openness online goes, goes awry. Yeah. I mean, it's why I delete my tweets. It's not very transparent. Someone told me that they can go to hell. <laughs> I think that is something that a lot of universities are waking up to, that they do need to have some kind of support system in place um, if either member staff or students are targeted and certainly something we're seeing in the UK is a lot more institutions are starting to look into putting policies and support in place to be able to do that whereas previously um, policies were more about kind of protecting institutions I think a lot of institutions are now aware that they need to be protecting their staff and their students as well and it's certainly I'm very encouraged to see institutions actually taking that seriously because it is a serious issue and and again, you know, when I am talking to people about, about blogging in the open, I do make the point that, um, I, I mean, I've been very lucky in my, my use of social media. I haven't been targeted. I haven't been trolled. I've seen it happen to many, many other people. And I know that I'm in a position of relative privilege and that there are other people who will get targeted a lot more than I will. Um, <coughs> and that, you know, women, people of color, um, various minorities will get targeted because of that. And then when I make this point frequently, you can see people going, really? Really? And not, you know, I haven't seen that. Is that really true? And I think we just have to keep repeating this. We have to keep raising awareness of this. Yeah, it hasn't happened to me. <laughs> um, what, what I find, uh, just uh, to add to that, uh, is that um, open very much works as an amplifier then of, of everything that is already happening and sometimes makes it even visible, much as the digital did like, I don't know, five or eight or ten years ago, 
open kind of amplifies everything that is already there um, and kind of makes these institutional policies sometimes visible, whereas they haven't been visible beforehand. How do we support students? How do we support staff? How do we support lecturers? Um, those kinds of conversations are being had right now, whereas they happened behind closed doors because nobody was able to see them in, a, in, in the first place. So that's kind of an interesting space and time to, to be in, I think. And one of the things um, that relates to that as well that we haven't really talked about is sort of the phenomenon of open washing. And I know, Lorna, that you, you've written about this a lot as well. But I'm, I'm quite concerned that, you know, some sometimes I think our sort of, and again, our is, is a question of, of who that might include. But I think particularly people who advocate a lot for open education, you know, come across that sort of semi-commercial kind of open... I don't know, open veneer on things that are actually, you know, highly commercialized, sophisticated products. Um, and I think in, to come back to Laura's um, opening question around ethical, you know, how do you make ethical decisions in this space? I think that is actually becoming more difficult from my point of view. Um, I'm sometimes really taken in by things and I think, oh yeah, that sounds great. And then like I do some more digging and then I'm like, Oh no, <laughs> oh no, that's like not at all what I was expecting. And I, I wonder if anybody in the room also has any thoughts, because I know that you know, you're all working actively in this kind of space, and it would be interesting to hear any examples, um, if there are any. But I also wonder, in terms of open washing, if either one of you have any thoughts on this. Uh, hi, I'm Ratka. I used to work for UNICEF and its innovation program and uh, some of the teams that you're mentioning kind of resonate with me because uh, open use, open data kind of is the heralding flag of all the innovation activities from WFP, UNDP to UNICEF and I often feel that uh, the countries or the recipients in the end have no say in what's happening to their data, to they are basically forced to use the certain platforms that come through, ideally through digital development principles, but more often it's very rigid, 50 years old standard procedures that are in place. So it's really hard how to behave ethically in a way when you are trying to achieve the SDGs 2030 and this is kind of your rallying call and you're doing everything to push everybody towards that but when it trickles down to the actual user in the end, he's given a ready-made solution that may not be totally comprehensible, but it is kind of having the badge of, ideally this is like open source technology or ideally this is not using anything wrong. So yeah. it's uh, also bringing it up to us in the one of the opening talks was like, how do you open this space, this space for decision making to people who are not yet there? and especially in the big international institutions, I think there is a long way to go maybe to achieve that. Can I just pick up on um, a comment there? I mean, you mentioned um, open source software and I think um, I, I very much support the use of um, open source software where at all possible um, for many reasons, particularly the transparency, but I think quite often open source software gets hailed as the alternative to big ed tech because it's, it's better, it's open, it's more diverse, blah, 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 it's all these things. But the whole open source domain has got a massive, massive diversity problem, a huge diversity problem. Um, it is, it's, you know, the, the, the gender bias and, and a lot of open source companies is worse than in commercial ed tech companies. And it's, I think a lot of people who work in that domain don't don't even want to realise that, never mind realising it and trying to take the steps to address it. And I think until the open source domain is more diverse and is more inclusive and there are more women, more people of colour employed in the development of these technologies, then you know, who are these technologies open for? And I think this the question of open for whom is really important. So when we are talking about the we, who are the we? And um, I think particularly, uh, and Wikimedia again, of course, is Wikipedia is another example of, you know, the sum of all knowledge. Whose knowledge? 
and you only have to look at English language Wikipedia to see the, the, the systemic um, problems with bias and with lack of gender diversity. And I mean, these issues are built into the whole structure of the platform. We know they're there, we're trying to address them, but it's a long, slow process. And again, as Laura said, it's hard work. It's really hard work to do that. But we do need to ensure that when we are talking about open, it's open for everyone and not just a very small subset of people. One question, comment from yeah. Oliver, right? Yeah, hi, um, my name is Oliver. I work for a German network called Hochschulforum Digitalisierung, uh, where we kind of bring together different stakeholders uh, in the higher ed scenery in Germany uh, around this you know, broad topic of digital transformation. And I haven't been able to follow the, the whole discussion uh, but I wanted to bring uh, two notes into uh, maybe your conversation. Uh, one that I find particularly interesting, uh, given that we had today the, you know, the European Commission next uh, uh, agenda or the the new, um, uh, uh, yeah, directorates uh, and and the Commission. Um, and one element that we go are going to discuss in a, in a conference two weeks uh, from now. Uh, is concerning the um, the governance structure uh, within uh, Europe and within maybe also the Bologna process, which is an interesting framework uh, for different um, stakeholders and where I feel um, maybe some of your um, points around openness need to be addressed, where we talk about new standards, where we maybe uh, need to look at uh, what is the policy side doing in, in Europe on this end when uh, maybe individual uh, rights are concerned. So we have some project pilots, uh, educational ID questions, sovereignty questions, and uh, the interesting debate should maybe be around, uh, at least to, to some point, uh, who is uh, defining those uh, standards and which kind of bodies are really uh, uh, addressing questions that you have been discussing here. So I just wanted to, to ask for your uh, point of view on that. And, and the second point I have forgotten, but maybe it comes back to me, maybe it's sufficient, thanks. The first one didn't seem too small, did it? So um, I think my, my most of my experience with policy making is probably UK based, but I do um, work a little bit with the European um, legislators as well. and. In my experience, you know, we, we are quite a long way behind making effective legislations and policies for the types of technology that we are seeing being implemented in education. Um, and also, I think we, we are um, some way away maybe at being able to make effective policies um, to try and examine some of the implications of the technology that we're using as well as you know student data for example or or, or some of the, the privacy issues um, I think this comes back to um, both Laura and Audrey mentioned that you know we are within the system and we're not operating outside the sort of uh, marketization of education but I think um, in my experience that's really where these two forces clash kind of policy versus market because there's obviously a really strong interest not to legislate more or not to make stronger policies um, or standards in order to, to, to keep the, the market as free as possible. I, I think in the UK, uh, I sadly have to say, we, we haven't really found much political will to, to change that. I really hope that the, the European legislators will be more um, interested. And I'm really encouraged, as one example in France recently, um, where they've invested federal funds um, across the whole of France um, to invest in, I believe, open source um, and openly shared between institution infrastructure to share between all higher education institutions. And um, this is, I think, supported by the work of the Aperio Foundation. So this is one area of sort of a very national European effort that I'm aware of currently, that I'm very curious to, to see what's coming out of that. Um, I think one of the challenges with a lot of the standards work and governance governance work is that we ha often these decisions get made in sort of government adjacent places, which are, despite having the look of being democratic, they're 
um, often quite anti-democratic. So when you look, for example, at something like the Linux Foundation, right, the, the major nonprofit um, that governs open source and the standard bodies, the, the standard um, organizing bodies that determine these various um, open source software, the people who sit on those bodies are Microsoft, IBM, Google. Um, and so it's very, the, it's almost impossible for an individual, even perhaps someone who contributes regularly um, as, a, as a developer to these tools, to have a say on the standards body, because the standards body is really something that's bought and paid for um, by, these, by these giant corporations, even under the auspices of something like open source. And I think that that's in part because we have, um, and I, I totally agree that our legislative bodies perhaps aren't up to the task, but we have to quickly get them there. Because I think that the, 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 if this is not public, if this is not something that we are dealing with uh, in terms of our public infrastructure, in terms of democratic institutions, then this is, um, then I'm not sure how we get outside this being governed by, governed by major, major corporate interests. And I think that that's one of the things that we can take from, you know, when we think about whether it's the neighborhood and the ring camera, or, or any of these conversations, sort of, we have to make sure that we make sure that the commons is public and not privatized space. And we have to make sure that the decisions, I think, are democratic decisions and not lobbyist decisions. But just allow me, uh, I mean, we are here in Wikimedia. So in a way, I, I wonder, uh, wouldn't it be uh, possible to, to, I don't know, um, you know, use the power of a uh, association like that to be on the on those sort of um, bodies and and uh, participate in decisions that are maybe not equally uh, uh, distributed in terms of power uh, workforce. However, I do think it's uh, it should be maybe an interesting objective to to think about that. That's ex that's exactly what I was going to say. I think when it comes to um, contributing to legislative policy on a national and a European level in particular, I think there really is definitely a role for organisations like the Association for Learning Technology, like the Wikimedia chapters, like the Aperio Foundation. These are membership bodies and I think by their nature they, ha they have more chance of being open and being representative and being answerable to their members. And, you know, I totally appreciate what Maren has said and that it's, it's really difficult. We're, we're pushing against a closed door at the moment, um, but, but we are pushing. You know, we are trying to make sure through organisations like Alt and like Wikimedia UK that we are contributing to these policy decisions. Um, and I think we just have to keep pushing at these doors. And I, I absolutely think there is a role for Wikimedia Deutschland for Wikimedia UK, for Alt, for Aperio, to try to influence these policy makers and these decisions because I really think, you know, that the, the power of these organisations is in the membership um, and the, the neutrality, I think, and that's really what's important. I'm back here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um. Is it our final question? Uh, it is. I was going to say that. So we, uh, some of you might have noticed there's a couple of snacks um, outside, so we'll do one last round of questions and then close the night with food and drinks. Thanks. Um, it's been um, a lot of really heavy issues raised and I think um, a really interesting opportunity to reflect on all, you know, I've also been in this movement for a long time, and as you said, you know, things we thought about five or ten years ago, and we're gung-ho, and we're, um, now we might think twice about it. Um, on the other hand, I hope that we don't kind of lose all hope and go out of here in, into the uh, rainy <laughs> evening, you know. So, I don't know, um, are there any, like, super inspiring stories that you could <laughs> tell us? <laughs> People doing great work, great opportunities, institutions, projects that you're just really excited about that that would be I think a nice kind of mm -hmm. energy boost Can I answer it? Yes. <laughs> you go first Laura so I'm giving a talk at OAB and that's what I'm 
going to try and answer because I got to the point where I felt so demoralized by all of these things that I really said to myself, I'm going to look for some, something to energize me. I mean, what do we do? I can't actually go home having read more of these stories being in this role. So you can come to my talk. <laughs> 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 but otherwise, I'm going to put the slides online. But I really do feel that there is a moment where it feels so overwhelming. And then every which way you get Martin showing you more things you haven't <laughs> seen or you, you know about. But you know that. And we actually have to build a counter narrative. I mean, that's what I want to talk about is what are the things that are out there? So I've been spending my weekends looking for those examples. You know, I, I want to put a book together that will kind of, the examples that will create the little dots that will make the counter narrative because we have to build this counter narrative. And sometimes we're still kicking at the door and sometimes people have opened the door a little bit and sometimes there's an example that we can go and say, look, they did it. So then we can, but you have to. I mean, you know that, that, that lovely Rebecca Solnit um, quote about hope is an axe. Mm. Hope is an axe for smashing down a door. And you have to have that axe that is a smashing down of the door. Because the slow change stuff is hard. Okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> I'd love to see what Brian Mathers does with the hope as an axe metaphor <laughs> and visuals, though. So I go next instead of holding the mic, and then we can go that way. Um, okay, I'd like to have, uh, can I have like two examples? I'll be quite quick with it. One is from my own institution terms. So like, I mean, Laura's talking about sort of like breaking down doors, and I think... <coughs> I, th I still think that openness and um, internet technology has opened access to education for a lot of people who would have otherwise denied it. And I think we're s certainly we're seeing this in institutions that are very ancient, very old, very grand institutions, certainly the institution where I work, the University of Edinburgh. Um, the university has always had a very strong civic mission and it's for many years has been running online master's courses. It got behind MOOCs quite early on, but also made sure to make all the MOOC content open so it wasn't all locked up in commercial platforms. Uh, Laura mentioned micro-credentialings earlier on as a means to widen participation. Um, we've recently um, started developing micro-masters, which you can take for free if you want, but you can also use that as a pathway into more formal master's qualifications. And these are just all different ways to enable people to access education through the University of Edinburgh that they would not have been able to otherwise. And one of my colleagues was recently in Rwanda interviewing um, students on one of our online um, health masters, I can't remember, it could have been public health, um, and just the testimony of the students was just amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. These are doctors and health professionals and nurses that are working all over the world who are able to take these professional master's qualifications alongside their jobs. And it's just listening to them speak is just really humbling. I mean, like really humbling. And I think that's an opportunity. And I think, you know, we need to keep aspiring to that, providing more of that and being able to listen to the experience of these people. And just very quickly, the other example, nothing to do with my institution at all, talking to Martin about this when we had a wee break. I think it is possible to subvert the technology as well. And the Martin's examples of the surveillance technology brought to mind um, the protests in Hong Kong, um, where they developed an app for tracking the police so that the protesters knew where the police were, so they could avoid them or they could go to them. And it was proved by Apple, but they'll find another way. They will find another way. And I think we're starting to, you know, these examples that Laura is looking for, we're starting to see them all over the world. We're seeing them in Hong Kong, we're seeing them in Chile, we're seeing them in Iraq. And I think the power of people when they come together is extraordinary. And I think maybe th the big technology companies want us to think that we come together through their platforms. But in actual fact, people can come together on the street and be incredibly powerful. Um, leaving with a happy note is really not my thing. <laughs> It's, it's not. Um, it's not what I do. Um, <laughs> I, but I will say this. Um, what I find reassuring is that 99.9999% of software is shit. And they make a lot of promises. This is the they, not the we, right? This is the new one. 
they make a lot of promises about the things that are coming, what the future is going to look like, the things that they can do. But have you ever tried to use any of it? It doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? Mark Zuckerberg testified a couple of months ago in front of Congress, and the senators asked him, you know, how, how, how do you plan on fixing this or that problem? And he, his response for all of it was, you know, our AI will take care of it. I mean, the AI at, at, at these companies can't even recommend people to be friends who aren't like your ex-wives. And uh, I mean, they're, it's just not good software. Um, I mean, that's frightening to think about when you think about how much it's governing our airplanes and our banks. But I'm trying to be positive. Really, it's the things that they promise are, um, are, are not there. I don't think that the capabilities are there. I don't think the capabilities to sort of have this machine-controlled world are five years, 10 years down the road. And I think that humans, humans will resist. I don't, I don't believe that we want our future um, to be a horrifying dystopia um, with, with Tom Cruise running around to, to liberate <laughs> us. Um, that's, that's terrifying. So I think, I think the software sucks, and I think human beings will resist. I'm not sure how to follow that. That was the nice point to finish. So I'm going to go for cats. That's always safe. But a few years ago, Audrey and I were both in an event, um, and it involved a speaker that was talking about 3D printing a cat um, a as if it was a real thing that was happening right there and then. And I was sitting in the audience, and, um, and I was just like, I have a cat. I was like, no, <laughs> you can't 3D print a cat, I'm sure. And I, I even went as far as Googling it, and it was definitely, you know, even on Google, it was not possible. But everybody else in the audience was like, I think this sounds great. Yeah, I'm 3D printing a cat. Um, and I'm really glad that those people are in the minority, because while there's a lot of snake oil, you know, most people know it's not possible to 3D print a cat. And I work for an organization, <laughs> and you have a cat wall, so I know you guys are cat fans. I've seen the wall to half the proof. But I work for an organization that, when I started working for it in 2008, had you know less than 1,000 people involved in it, and now there's more than 3,500. And while I don't believe numbers mean everything, I do think people vote with their feet when they have to pray for the privilege in order to keep me employed to contribute to an open project and open cause. So I feel that there is hope in criticality. I think the more I know about what's going on behind that color-coded dashboard, the more I can ask the right questions, and the more I can be prepared and tell the people who I represent and work for you know, how they can be prepared. So I feel the more I know, the more I feel hopeful, because as Audrey says, you know, it really... 99% of it is shit, and you can't 3D print cats. So <laughs> closing <laughs> remark. <laughs> not, not quite yet. I have one, one last dash of hope here from, from the OFSA. Um, two, actually. And the first one being, I remember a conversation that Henry Jenkins had with Ezra El Shafei at, I think, DML 2017. And she spoke about how she innovates with her communities in the places that she works. In. And uh, if you haven't seen the talk, I'm sh pretty sure if you put it in your favorite search engine, you'll find it. Um, because the, the she mentioned and she made the remark that um, while most of the technology that you, Audrey, have been referring to as shit, they have found ways in their projects to actually develop software that works especially to their purpose and to their needs and to their kind of hopes. And that kind of uh, does give one hope every once in a while, I hope at least. And the other one I have is um, that when there is no more hope, there's always chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's a segue from hell. but. Um, we did actually bring you um, and get you a couple of presents. So thank you again to all our guests who have made it here tonight. Um, that is Lorna, that's Laura, that's Audrey, that's Marin, that's Martin. Um, I hate to do it in this kind of fashion, but I'm obviously <laughs> a bit um, immobilized. Um, so pick, pick one, um, preferably from the top. Um, 
thank you all for taking the time. I know you have busy lives. You're keynoting tomorrow and kicking some butt probably, I hope. Um, we have some vegetarian snacks. We have non-alcoholic drinks. We will start sweeping you all out by 9-ish PM. Um, and have fun. Enjoy the ongoing conversations. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>